I want to talk to you about Jacob, the patriarch. And the reason I want to talk about Jacob is because exactly what our brother Malcolm said as he introduced the studies today. He said that as you go through life, more and more and more, you relate to this man, Jacob. And I found, upon reading him, that my heart would spark time and again when I saw him and I saw how he was making decisions. And I saw a man that had deep and abiding conviction in the things of God and loved the things of God. And yet, at every turn, struggled not to take life in his own hands to bring about his own purposes and to achieve his own ends. And so how does a man like Jacob learn to wait on God? You'll notice something very interesting about Jacob. He he says it right there at the end of his life, I believe it's chapter 49, but since I don't have my notes with me, we'll just give it a go. How about that? Chapter 49, and it's stuck right in between the blessings he gives to Dan and to Gad. In fact, it appears to be almost like a non sequitur. Something that appears, it's not out of sequence, but it kind of appears that way at first. And it's found there in verse 18 of chapter 49 where we read Jacob saying, I have waited for thy salvation, O Yahweh. So it's almost as Jacob is towards the very end of his life, as if to sum up his life. He's saying, I have waited. But something strikes you about Jacob is Jacob's not much of a waiter. Did did Jacob wait for the birthright? Did he wait for the blessing? Did he wait to ask for Rachel's hand in marriage? Did he wait before leaving the tents of Lenten? I'm sure on occasion Jacob had to wait. He was forced to wait as he married his two wives, but it wasn't really by choice, was it? Jacob's not much of a waiter. In fact, this, this word wait is, the, is in Hebrew kava. It's used 45 times in the Old Testament. But this is the only time I could find where it was applied by a character to himself. In contrast, it's, it's, you know, Moses never uses it in that sense, and Abraham never uses it in that sense, and Joshua never uses it in that sense, and David never uses it in that sense, and neither does Samuel or any of these other Bible characters of some import. But Jacob applies this word wait to himself. But he's not a waiter. And in fact, if you turn over to Hosea chapter 12, where the prophet Hosea is summarizing the life of Jacob, you'll find there that Hosea also uses this word kava. We'll pick up in verse 3 for the context. He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with God. Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him at Bethel, and there he spake with us, even the Lord God of hosts. The Lord is his memorial. Therefore turn to thy God, keep mercy and judgment, and wait on thy God continually. So the, it's, it's as if the prophetic emphasis on Jacob is to learn to wait on God. Jacob, at the end of his life, saying, I have waited for thy salvation. And you look at Jacob and you say, when did you wait? On purpose. But yet that is the lesson that collectively we are meant to understand about Jacob. And so we're meant to understand that, that in his life, the exhortation for us is that we learn to wait 
on God. Now, by the way, if you want to wait on God, I do not suggest practicing keeping mercy and judgment. That is a bad way to wait on God. You know, it's a bad, if I really want something, if I really want something, it's a bad method to be easy on you and to be hard on myself. Think, think as, as a contrast, look at, look at Ahab who wanted the vineyard. He wasn't showing mercy and he wasn't keeping judgment. If you want something, be hard on others and be easy on yourself. But if you really want to learn to wait on God, be easy on others. Show them mercy and be hard on you. Hold yourself out to a higher standard than you hold out your brothers and sisters towards. I wish I could learn this. I wish I could teach this to my children. Malcolm, you're laughing. <laughs> Any other parents understand this? That, you know, our natural reaction is to be hard on you and to be easy on me. So somehow in Jacob's life, we need to learn the lesson. And Jacob needs to learn the lesson. Of how, how am I possibly going to be hard on myself and easy on you? How am I going to possibly learn to wait? Because I look at the life of Jacob, and the way I see it, a lot of his life can be divided into the activities of pursuing, avoiding, and complaining. Now, I'm not, I'm not unmindful that God calls himself the God of Jacob. And this man was a man of faith. But I actually think he's far more relatable when we look closely at him. I think much of his life was spent pursuing or avoiding. Or when he couldn't pursue, when he couldn't avoid, darn it, he could complain. And I, I, I asked for him 147 to be played as an opening and as a closing hymn. Because hymn 147 captures what I would like to make as a theme for our time spent this weekend. And look at verse 3. I'm going to look at the slide too because I don't have my notes. Only be still and wait his leisure in cheerful hope with heart content to take whate'er thy father's pleasure and all discerning love hath sent. No doubt our inmost wants are known to him who seeks us for his own. But my question for you and my question for me this weekend is, how can we be still? How can we wait? How do we trust? How do we simply do our part faithfully? Now, if you have no problems with being still or waiting, or trusting, or doing your part faithfully, no matter the circumstances, then just go along for the ride this weekend and come to me because I got some questions for you. Because to me, this is the crisis of my faith. Is I know what I want. And I know what you should want. I'm not good at waiting. I was the youngest child, darn it. I didn't have to wait for much. I have trouble trusting. I may appear that I trust you, but secretly I don't. It's taken me this long to even trust my wife the way I trust her now. I, I, don't, I don't trust very easily. And so I feel an almost overwhelming compelling to control. To control you, to control me, to control my circumstances, to avoid pain, to pursue pleasure, and when I can't get either of those two things, to complain about it. Unless I actively decide to do it, almost never does it occur to me, maybe, this is exactly what should have happened. 
Maybe God is for me. Maybe God is working with me. Maybe these things are turning out exactly the way they're supposed to turn out. Maybe God will bring good from this. Maybe, just maybe, God is with me. Just maybe. That does not occur to me. In the natural sense, not at all does that occur to me. And if that occurs to you, then wonderful. But it doesn't occur to me. And I think for much of Jacob's life, it didn't occur to him. And so when he says at the end of his life, I have waited on thy salvation, when Hosea says, so we learn to wait on God continually, that's what I want to learn. That's why I began to study. That's what I want to try to convey to myself and to you this weekend. That is the subject of what we're going to be doing together. Okay. So, that being said, I just want to make three points then. One point on the condition of Jacob's journey to Bethel. One point on Jacob's reaction to the vision. And one point as a comment on his vow. Okay, those three points, and then I promise I'll conclude. Now, you may have not thought about it carefully, but Jacob's journey to Bethel would have been done in an incredible amount of duress. Now, we know that because we're told in Genesis chapter 27 and verse 41 that Esau is duped. It says that, it says there in Genesis 27 verse 41, Esau says in his heart, the days of mourning for my father at hand, then I will slay Jacob. Now, what's really funny is the next verse. So we're told in Genesis chapter 27 verse 41 that Esau says this in his heart. Now, what's funny about the next verse, brethren? I just want to ask the brethren here. What's funny about the next verse? Is he says it in his heart, and the next thing he know, his mom knows. How does they, how, how do moms do that? How do moms do that? He said it in his heart. Suddenly his mom knows. I don't, I, I don't, I have no idea how that works, but you know, this is the Bible even records it. They can read our minds. So so that in the next verse, Rebecca has knowledge of this resentment, which in Hebrews chapter 12 is called a root of bitterness. He had a root of bitterness, Esau did. And, and, and Rebecca knows to be weary of it, right? Because resentments are very dangerous things. It's, it's when, I, when I concentrate and think and mull over the pain, I get a sordid pleasure in meditating on how much it hurt me. And the only way to counteract resentment is with mercy and judgment. Mercy, to be, to be merciful to someone who's done wrong, to give them forgiveness and, and justice, to say that I'm not going to do wrong, even if I want to, because it wouldn't be right. But, but Rebecca knows that Esau doesn't have mercy or judgment in any great quantities at all. And so she's very rightly concerned about this. And so she wants to get Jacob out of the tents of Isaac as soon as possible. And she says, I, she, she has an idea. She's going to send them away to her brother. And then she's going to call for him in a couple days. Well, a couple days turns into a couple decades. It's almost as if God had needed to do that for, with, for, with Rebecca so that God would be able to teach her that her scheming had only worked because God had been in it, not because she had schemed it. You know, and this is the one scheme that didn't appear to turn out as planned. And so she sends, she sends Jacob away, and he, Jacob's going in a lot of distress. Um, we get the sense that there's a lot of distress, um, because look how far he goes in just a single day. Now, here, what we have here is a map of Israel. And down there in the first dot at the bottom, I've marked Beersheba. And the dot at the top, I've marked Bethel. Now, what do you see between Beersheba and Bethel? I tell you what you see. You see a lot of hills. Getting from Beersheba to Bethel, that, that's, that's, no, that's no small feat. There's a lot of up and down there. That's over 60 miles. It almost seems impossible to me that he does that in one day. Maybe he did. 
But if he did, it's because he rose early in the morning like Abraham was known to do, and he would have pushed on well, well after dark. Now, maybe he did do it in one day because he was so tired he fell asleep with his head on a, on a rock. you got to be pretty tired to do that. And, and, and notice, he says later, a little bit later on, he's going to say when he comes across the Jordan with two bands, he says in, in remarking, God, I, I've come across Jordan now with two bands. When I, when I came across Jordan the first time, all I had was a staff. And, and, and what it, we know that all he had is a staff because he's meaning to draw the contrast between his great wealth then and his meager wealth at the time he crossed. Now just contrast that with Abraham's servants who went to, who went to visit uh, Syria, paid Naram the first time with ten camels. That's what you do when you're planning a journey. You're going you're gonna to journey from there up to, uh, to pay Naram? Well, you're going to take ten, ten camels with supplies. Not Jacob, he, he's just leaving with a staff and maybe a cruise of oil. He doesn't have very much, I don't think. He's, what, what, if you're going to go from Beersheba to Syria, I don't know that you take that route anyways. It doesn't seem like you would. seems like a lot up and down to me. I mean, I'd probably go, maybe I don't know, I'd maybe go to the Dead Sea, stop in Gedi, get some water, go across the Jordan and up, up the King's Highway. I don't know. Right, but I certainly wouldn't go up and down the middle of the country. Why would you do that? Unless you're running for your life. You're terrified that Esau actually might get wind that you left and come chasing after you, maybe. You're tired to keep running. You're tired to keep going. You're fleet of foot. You don't want you don't want animals to slow you down. You don't want you don't want camels, they're too slow. You need to go as fast as you can. You're traveling lightly. You're going the way that no one's going to think you're going. You got up when it was still dark. It's still dark, you're still going. That's Jacob. It's, he's going to say a little bit later on, um, in Genesis 35 and verse 3, God going to call him back to Bethel, and read there, and Jacob says to his, to his household at that time, in Genesis 35, verse 3, let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. So Jacob calls this day the day of his distress. Jacob is distressed as he's going. I want, I want you to see if you can imagine this. You're setting out on a dangerous trip to another land. You're fearing for your life as you go. You're in great distress. You're carrying as little as possible. You're taking the hard road to be avoided. You're pushing hard all day, long, all night to get to the distance. You're straining well after sunset for as long as you can imagine. That's what it was like when Jacob was leaving his father's tent. This is the frame of mind that Jacob is in. When he sees that vision. Of course, why does he go to Bethel? He goes to Bethel because, because of the irony. Well, we know what happened at Bethel because we know that when, when Lot separated from Abram and Lot chose the verdant pastures by the river and Abraham's left on the dry hills, which Bethel was one of those dry hills, higher elevation than Jerusalem is Bethel. So there's Abraham and he's dry, barren hills and there's the verdant valley where we see Lot going, God is going to tell Abraham, Abram at that time, he's going to say, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art, northward and southward and eastward and westward, for all the land that thou seest, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. And this is why I think Jacob wants to go into Bethel. Because at the point of separation, this is the promise that God had made to Jacob's grandfather. And the irony was now, because Jacob was so interested in that promise, was so interested with the things concerning Abram, that taking upon himself to align himself with those things, 
he now had to leave the land that was promised to his grandfather. And so what happens when he gets to Bethel? I'll tell you what happens. I think he sees a broken down altar. So here he was. He had deceived Esau and Isaac to receive a blessing. And that blessing was one of rulership and one of priesthood. It was the right to the blessings and the fruitfulness of the land. It was the right to be in the line of the chosen seed. And at the core of the promise was the land he was now gazing upon. And the irony was, because he so desperately and deceitfully sought for it, he had to leave it. It comes to a broken down altar. And I want you to kind of think of, of Jacob coming to that altar and being so utterly and completely exhausted exhausted, and he finally gets there. And strewn stones. And he collapses. He takes one of those stones, he puts his head on it, and he goes to sleep. And the King James says he sees a ladder. It wasn't a ladder as we would understand a ladder, but it's not exactly clear what it was. It could have been a staircase. And what does he see? He sees angels. And they're ascending and descending. And since Sunday school, we've known that that's significant because it shows that the angels were present. If if they had descended first, you might conclude, well, well, you see, what happens is that the angel's there for a while, and then when the angel's done with his business, the angel goes back up to God. And when the angel goes back up to God, you know, then it's up to me. Then I got to apply my own wits, and I got to imply, apply my own intelligence. See, when the angel goes back up to God, then I'm on my own, and I got to look to my own resources. But this vision would have proven the opposite. The angel's work is on the earth. That's where it starts. That's where it stretches out to the Lord in heaven. That's where it finishes. It connects the two in space and time. So, so Jacob's meant to see this. He's meant to see that God is working. He's meant to see that God doesn't leave him for a while, then come back, then leave him for a while, then come back, then leave him for a while, and all the intervening intervals, he's on his own. He was meant to conclude that that never happens. That cycle never happens. That he's constantly in the under angelic care. That must have been the emphasis because verse 15 of Genesis 28 says, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again to this land. I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And so you see the point. I will not leave thee, Jacob. I am with thee. He says it in the positive. He says it in the negative. He relates to where he is. He relates to where he's going to go. There's a permanence with it. But why do you think Jacob needed this message, brothers and sisters? Because clearly he did. Why did he need this message? I'll tell you why. Because he didn't believe it. That's why he needed it. You might say, though, that's impossible. The man would have known these promises since he was a small child. He would have heard the stories of angelic message and intervention. intervention. How is it that he wouldn't have known and believed and had had conviction that God was with him? Well, the same way you and I don't know it. You know, we've, we've known these scriptures since we were a child. We believe what they say. 
But you see, in the humdrum of life, somehow you think to yourself, what's different for me? I don't, I don't want it to be different, but somehow it just feels different. Well, I'm, I'm sure that God is with others. Surely God was with them, but I'm not sure he's with me. I don't know that the angels ascend because I don't know that they were there to begin with. And when you feel that the most, and when I feel that the most, is when I have just taken matters into my own hands. When I couldn't wait any longer, when I was so desperate for what I wanted that I took what I wanted and suddenly everything's collapsed around me. I think, well, I'm really on my own this time. I'm really on my own this time. I mean, I messed up. My brother wants to kill me. I'm leaving the land of promise. I have caused this mess, and this mess is mine. God is surely not with me now because I caused the problem. I caused the mess. So now I am really on my own. Don't you think? Don't you think that? Don't you think when you've caused the mess that you've got to fix it? Because I caused this mess. So surely I'm on my own this time. Don't you think? Or would it be natural for Jacob to maybe have thought that this time? I think about Jacob. He had just sinned and lied to his father. His brother wanted to kill him. He might be thinking something like this. I have nowhere to sleep. It's cold. I'm tired and alone. I have hardly any food, and I'm hungry. Is God with me? Of course he's not. I've made mistakes. I've sinned. Maybe, maybe he would be with me if I had been as faithful as my father's. And now I've come to Bethel. And all I see is a broken down altar. Where's God? Can you see Jacob in that moment? Can you see that he now thinks life is in his hands? That's why God gives him that message. God is saying, you've messed up and I'm still with you. You've taken matters into your own hands. I'm still with you. You're fleeing the promised land. I'm still with you. At that moment, he needed that message. And I do too. Don't you? Jacob's not so different. But... But the issue now is that Jacob didn't understand the message. Because notice the emphasis here in Genesis 20, chapter 28, verse 16. Surely the Lord is in this place. I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And in my Bible, I've colored in the word this in red which is my bad color. Because I have simple simple ideas. And I only have so many colors I can use, and red's my bad one. This place. Now, I just want to contrast that for a moment with what God actually told him. God had said, I am with thee, and I'll keep thee in all places where thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And so I've colored that in in green, which is a good color. But however you want to color in these phrases, I, can we miss the emphasis here? These verses are juxtaposed to one another. They are back to back. 
God had said, I am with thee. And Jacob said, God is here. In this place. And the issue is one of misplaced trust. Because how many years later was it that there was a king of Israel, the first one, and his name was Jeroboam? And Jeroboam was very scared about the people in his land going down every year to worship in Jerusalem. And Jeroboam says, oh, I have an idea. I will set up a golden calf. I'll call it Yahweh. And I'll, do you know where I'm going to put that golden calf? Oh, I know. I'll put that calf in Bethel. Because didn't our father Jacob say, God is in that place. That place is the gate of heaven. And years later, a king of Judah named Josiah would turn the gate of heaven into the gate of death because he would dig up the bones and burn them on the altars and grind that place to powder. And the reason I say that is because God was asking Jacob to put trust in God. When we put trust in people or places or institutions, we will be disappointed. That is a false basis for trust. There's only one rock that will not be moved. It is the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ, against which the gates of death will not prevail. And if you are a Petros, if you are a stone built on that foundation, you will stand. And if you are not built on that foundation, you are stone for stumbling and will be ground and destroyed. But there is only one foundation, one rock that cannot be moved. And that is not Bethel, that is not a place, that is not an institution, that is only and will only ever be the Lord Jesus Christ. And all that God has instituted through him. So I bring this out to show that that Jacob has this wrong understanding of trust. And I just want to ask you the question, and I want you to think for a moment about the life of Jacob. In Jacob's life from this point forward, you tell me how many people do you think Jacob can really trust from this point forward? Could he trust Laban? Could he trust his wives? Could he trust his sons? Who is Jacob supposed to trust? I am with you. I am with you wherever you go. Jacob, of all people, would need to learn there is only one basis for trust. So I just want to compare this now with Jacob's vow, and then we'll finish. Jacob's vow is found in Genesis chapter 28, starting at verse 20. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall Yahweh be my God, and the stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give 
a tenth unto thee. Do you understand Jacob here? I've had people come to me and say they they really don't like this vow at all. I don't have a comment so much on the worthiness of the vow as I have a comment on that I understand the vow. You see, God has just said to Jacob, I am with you. I will not leave you. I will bring you again to this land. He has shown evidence of angelic work. And so Jacob is saying, okay, God, okay, God, I believe that you got the big things. The big things like the land. Yep, you got that squared away. But, and God, and God, I believe, I believe in you, and I believe that, that you are in this place, but, you know, there's something more that I need to know. Lord, I, I, I've slept all night in the cold. See, so, so I, need, I need clothing. I, I'm cold. And, and Lord, I, I have nothing to eat. And I'm hungry. And, and Lord, I'm running for my life. And I'm scared. And Lord, thank you for being with me in the big things. But Lord, I'm down here struggling with the details. I don't, I don't need a lot, Lord. But if you could just please make sure that I have clothing and food and safety back to my father's house. See, that's what I'm struggling with, Lord. And if you do those things, then you'll be my God. See, see, God, I, I believe you got the big things covered. Gee, you brought Israel back into the land. That's a miracle. You're working with the nations. I, I can see that. But you know I'm cold. Did you know that I'm hungry? Did you know that I'm thirsty? Do you know that I'm scared? Do you know that I actually just want to go back? I want to walk back into my father's house right now and know that my brother's not going to kill me. So someone criticized Jacob at this moment. I could see why. I could see why someone criticized Jacob that this is a moment of weak faith. I would just temper that if it is Note that God says in Genesis chapter 31, verse 13, I am the God of Bethel, God says, where thou anointest the pillar and where thou vowest a vow unto me. So God acknowledges the vow. I think this is Jacob revealing to God exactly where he was at. And here's my question. How do you wait on God when you're hungry? How do you wait on God when you're cold? How do you wait on God when you're scared? Do you have answers to these questions? Are you going to exhort Jacob? Do you know the answer to those questions? Jesus would tell us to pray each day for daily bread. But later on in the chapter, he'll say this. Jesus will say, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? After all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. 
Now, I can't say for certain, but it sure sounds to me like the Lord Jesus Christ has Jacob in mind as he says those words. Of course, taking thought for food and drink. And of course, taking thought for his clothing and thinking a lot about the morrow. But there's one other link. Maybe, maybe you could see if you think it's an interesting connection. Turn over with me to Genesis chapter 47 and verse 9. Genesis 47, is, of course, we're jumping way ahead in the story now, but this is when Jacob is about to meet Pharaoh. And Pharaoh can see Jacob is a very old man. And so Pharaoh asked Jacob about his great age. And Jacob said to Pharaoh in verse 9, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are in 130 years. Few and evil have the days of my years of my life been. And so the Lord Jesus Christ says, Take no thought for the things of tomorrow, for the things of tomorrow shall take thought for themselves. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So maybe, just maybe, the Lord Jesus Christ did have Jacob in mind as he said this. And if so, Christ in this verse is giving us the answer for Jacob's life. Or for men like Jacob, which is to seek first the kingdom. And that may be the answer But why is that the answer? We'll have to come back to that question later on. But we know for certain that what this verse is also saying is God doesn't just understand the big things of our lives. He doesn't just understand the the land and the promises and Israel and those big things. The Lord Jesus Christ is saying that God understands and knows the details. That is clearly the emphasis here. God knows God knows that these are things that you need. So how do you wait on God? Do you sit there and do nothing? Well, you seek first the kingdom of God. You get busy with the Lord's work. And see if this isn't the admonition of our hymn, which we sang earlier. And if thou but suffer God to guide thee, and hope in him through all thy ways, he'll give thee strength, whate'er betide thee, and bear thee through the evil days who trust on God's unchanging love, build on the rock that naught can move. So what are our principles then of surrender, which we might have observed then in this introductory study? To surrender, we must learn to wait on God. This is the exhortation of Jacob's life, which we will focus on together. When we take matters into our own hands, we can achieve the exact opposite of what we want. We thought we wanted the land and the promises thereof. We find ourselves fleeing for our lives, leaving the promised land that we so so carefully coveted. To wait means we must place trust in God, that he is with us wherever we are, even if we've gotten ourselves in the sticky situation that we're in. Placing trust in institutions, places, and peoples can undermine trust. 
as Jacob found out. And God understands our large and small concerns, and he can bear us through the evil days as he did Jacob.